this special bonus episode of Rails to Nowhere. I'm Simon, a railway history student and occasional train driver, and joining me is Ella, fellow railway nerd and history student. Hello! As you may know, we have a patron for those of you who want to help us make the podcast and as a thank you for your support we promise that we will throw some extra special bonus content your way as one of these me and ella produce an extra bonus episode every month these episodes look at aspects of our research the study of history more generally or simply something interesting that we found while researching for the main episode but we maybe didn't have time to go into this month however we've decided to give you a hint of what these bonus episodes are like so here is the first patron bonus episode out on the public feed yes and hopefully this will give you something interesting to think about you'll want to subscribe to the patron and help us make this because uh to make this episode and to make the first proper episode simon has been to the national archives and i've been to multiple libraries in london and these things aren't cheap (laughs) it's it's not cheap it takes time we could be doing other things so yes supporting us helps us to take the time to make these episodes proper history like doing proper history and not just pilfering the wikipedia article is uh very time consuming and can be very expensive it really is for my episode for september i have spent now probably i want to say six or seven hours inside libraries closed off libraries that have uh, very expensive memberships if you're not a student <laughs> thankfully uh, i get thankfully i get these memberships a bit cheaper or free but even that it, it's still not cheap to visit these places and i've spent many hours in them now in in rare book rooms and and i'll be off to the national archives next month to go and dig deeper um again like this isn't just copying the wikipedia page this stuff really is stuff that while not unknown, is not in the public eye, let's say. Yes, so, some of certainly some of the stuff I've looked at for uh, this bonus episode and um, the main episode on the Railway Act and the stuff you're looking at for next month, um, we're finding there's actually a fair bit of stuff just below the surface that is actually quite interesting, but very few people actively know about a lot of this stuff. So this month's main episode's been on the Railway Act 1921, which um, obviously in many ways is kind of the first big step towards nationalisation. Yep. Um, And for today's bonus episode, I want to take a look in a bit more detail at one of the big figures in the Railway Act 1921. Mm. Um, who is Eric Geddes. Um, Geddes, uh, Geddes, I think. Um, Geddes makes the most sense. Yeah, we're going to say that today's episode is on Eric Geddes. If anyone knows that I'm pronouncing that wrong, then please shout at me in the comments. And uh, if they ever come up again, I'll try to get their name right. And if we do find these things, there will be corrections listed and you will be credited for them. Yes. Because that is how proper history works. (laughs) So Eric Geddes was possibly the main driving force behind the Railway Act 1921. Mm-hmm. I have never heard of this man. He's relatively unknown. This is one of these wonderful things. This is what these bonus episodes and hopefully the main episodes are about. is about bringing to light some stuff that's there, but not very well researched. It's been quite hard finding information about him. He's got a Wikipedia article. He's mentioned in passing in a fair few books. Mm-hmm. Um, one of my favourite books for being a good bedrock for this um, sort of history is Bagwell and Leith's Transport in Britain since uh, 1700. Mm. It forms a bedrock of a lot of my university essays, even at master's level. It mentions Geds um, a little bit and a little bit in passing, but he's not very well known about. But he's kind of the principal driving force behind the Railway Act 1921, and he was the first Minister of Transport. Ah, is that where the MOT test comes from, the etymology? Yeah. Today I learned something. It is your Ministry of Transport test. 
Today I learn. Yeah, so in the main episode, we talk a bit about the Ministry of Transport. Today, I want to talk a bit about Geds before the 1921 Railway Act and the Ministry of Transport. Mm -hmm. So where did he come from? Well, Geds was born in the late 1800s in India, and he had a bit of a rocky um, career before the First World War. He started off um, moving to America, went into the railways there. Um, working in the Baltimore and Ohio before eventually moving through the Indian Railways and then back into England, where he ended up with the Northeastern Railway. Mm. And here in the Northeastern Railway, he rose to the post of Deputy General Manager in 1911 and came to the attention of a certain David Lloyd George. Ah, hello. Who you may have heard of. Maybe, just a little bit. And so Geds was appointed as part of the committee that was looking at how the Railway Executive Committee could be formed and functioned in the event of war. So this is prior to the First World War. Geds is part of the body that's looking at how the railways could be coordinated to be part of the war effort. Quite interesting that at this point, railways were very much realised as like, we need to have a coordinated system in the event yes. of war. Um, and the tactical advantage of a railway in a, wars, in a wartime situation and this ability to move mass amounts of people and goods, I mean, obviously that, 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 it, it, change, it changes wars. And you see, yes. especially in the Second World War, the advance through Europe in the, towards the end was slowed mm. greatly, uh, the initial advance, by the fact that Germany just ripped up railways left, right and centre. They were one of the main arteries. Exactly. The wars that preceded the First World War were themselves industrialised. Mm. The First World War has been called the First Industrial War by some, but actually aspects of the American Civil War and um, some aspects Quite. of the Napoleonic and had proved to be as industrial as the First World War was. So combined with the growing sense that actually the, the fractured nature of Britain's railways was causing problems for civilian peacetime transport in the early 1900s with the growing tensions that were occurring betwe between the various great powers of Europe, there was a sense that actually if a big war was to happen between the great powers of Europe, industrial warfare would be what would occur and the militaries needed to understand how they could use the industrial base of their country to support that. Mm. And of course, Britain's railways are set up for ports but they're not set up in quite the right way to ship quite the right stuff to ports for a war so mm. there was concern about what would happen if britain's military was unsupplied mm. and at, at this point for context we don't have things for those who wonder we don't have the heavy goods vehicle or anything this is 1911 we are dealing yeah. with very small. So the Model T was contemporary, and yeah. I'm sure we all know what the Model T looked like. Yeah, and you're talking as I as I cover a bit in the I've covered a bit in the main episode. We're talking vans of a couple of tons of capacity. Um, if you want proper large scale movement of goods or people, you're talking either um, water transport or railways. Yes, I mean a lot a lot of people think the railways like placed the canals and waterborne transport outright actually not really no um i mean even today um water transport still is a thing that mm. occurs still happens and obviously on the international scale you see huge massive ships like the ever given which as we know like contemporaries of this recording crashed about what six months ago now in the yeah. Suez and just locked up global shipping for about a week while they dug it out and that thing has millions of tons on board um yeah and that's so the thing is the first world war was to an extent and the second world war as well one of the big events that actually ended a lot of the bulk cargo shipping for domestic transport within Britain because one of the big flows was coal from the northeast mm. down to the southeast but of course, once you've got torpedoing by submarines of merchant shipping, as occurred in the First World War, that flow becomes extraordinarily dangerous and damaging to the war effort to lose it. So we see this is when we start seeing the 
final end of big bulk shipping um, within the UK. Because a ship is, quite honestly, kind of vulnerable. Yeah. Especially on open water, you can torpedo it, and that just sinks, you know, an entire city's coal supply for a day. Yeah, because we think about unrestricted submarine warfare in the Second World War, but the Germans were doing that in the First World War as well, because capturing a crew and capturing a ship when you're piloting a submarine is not a thing you can do no you can't so you sink it your option is put a hole in the side or just leave it yeah that's just a physical limitation of subs yeah so these are the sort of problems that the railway executive committee and the preparations for that were meant to address like how do we coordinate moving the hundreds of thousands of tons of coal that go down barges down the east coast and put them on the railways that while yeah capable of big bulk carrying are not um are not set up for that flow mm. it also was obviously meant to address um the fact that war would impact the finances of the railways and that's where ged's first First comes to the attention of the government. So you might expect that his involvement in the war is going to be on the Railway Executive Committee, but it's not, because Lloyd George ends up as Minister of Munitions. He's appointed to this position because there's an enormous shortage of munitions on the front. The military is firing more shells at the Germans than anyone has fired at anyone before like the first world war is a war on a scale that no one has seen before mm, it is just totally destructive and you still you still yeah. see to this day it bits are being dug up of first world war munitions and first world war just mass graves and all sorts of horrific things because yeah. it is just so massively destructive i've I've been to Flanders, I've been to Ypres, I've seen the graveyards, I've seen the war memorials, I've seen shell craters that still exist, and it's just on a scale that is unimaginable. Like, you read about it in books, you listen to it on history shows, you see footage of it, but just the scale of the First World War is just incomprehensible. And Britain, by early 1915 was running out of ammunition. Mm. And so responsibility for that was taken away from the War Department and given to a new Ministry of Munitions, headed by David Lloyd George, Mm. who took a novel approach to appointing people to his new ministry, Mm. which was to appoint technocrats. (laughs) He took people that weren't politicians, that weren't the military that that were traditionally involved in the running of the government and appointed them based on their ability within business. Mm. One of those people was Eric Geddes, who he appointed as one of his assistants within the Ministry of Munitions. And Geddes was responsible, among other things, for coordinating how many shells were meant to be being produced. Okay. Not very railway, is it? <laughs> not yet, not yet. So... Under Lloyd George um, and within the Ministry of Munitions, Geds worked to up the quantity of munitions being produced to organise the factories. He used his experience within the railways of logistics to massively increase the number of shells and munitions being produced. However, this produced another problem, which would be Geds's next problem to solve. So by 1917, Lloyd George was now Minister of War. Upgrade. (laughs) And we come to perhaps one of the most famous battles the British Army has ever fought. Mm. And we arrive at the Somme. And we arrive at a situation where all of the munitions that Geddes has now ensured are being produced cannot reach the front. They're getting to France. Huge. They're getting to France. Um, Earlier in the war, the British Army had engaged with the London, Chatham and Dover Railway to um, improve the nature of the ports. The the London, Chatham and Dover manages um, the port of Dover, Folkestone. Yes, London, Chatham and Dover is what what would now be called Southeastern Railway. Yeah. So that, for those who aren't in the UK, that is the kind of the bottom bit where you get... Yeah. 
Thames coming into London, you've got that big estuary. It's kind of the bit below London and that estuary and to the right of it. The London Chatham and Dover Railway manage the railway just to the southeast of England, bordering the Channel. Mm. So they manage the supply in the railways into some of Britain's biggest and busiest ports. They manage the flow into Dover, into Folkestone. And so earlier in the war, the British Expeditionary Force, which is the army in France, have contracted people from the London Chatham and Dover Railway to come over and look at ports in France and work out how to orientate these towards the war effort. And so the ports are relatively well set up, but the rail network's not. In Flanders and um, in the specifically in the area where the British are operating, we're basically running at this stage. We're basically running whatever was the French civilian rail network when the Germans arrived. Mm. There's a little bit of extra track and there's a little bit of extra narrow gauge stuff, but more or less, we're just trying to run our military trains through whatever the French had built during times of peace. And we're not even at the actual border at this stage. We're just in the middle of fields, in the middle of the countryside. So we're not at major terminals. We're not at major freight hubs. We're looking at, like, single track, maybe at best a double track setup. And yeah. The local, there was the local a, town station. If I'm remembering the map correctly, I think there was one double track line and one single track line going to the British sector of the front. Mm, sounds like um, a problem. Yeah. And so... The British Army is faced with huge delays of getting munitions to the front. They go from having around 16 ammunition trains a week to having 90 per week going towards the front Mm. in the lead up to the Somme. It is an enormous undertaking and it causes delays. It causes hours, Mm. days, backlog of trains trying to get to the front. Mm. And that's just ammunition trying to move to the front and men trying to be moved to the front Mm. it's not even the stuff coming back it's not the ambulance trains Mm. it's not um wounded soldiers coming back and these are things that you need to get away from the front these are problems (laughs) yeah like the purpose of the ambulance trains and the troop trains away from the front is you don't want wounded people Mm at the front clogging up your trench you need to get them away that's as important for fighting your war as getting ammunition to the people fighting it Mm. so in the middle of the battle of the somme lloyd george appoints geds to go to france and inspect and review the rail situation on the british section of the front so now we introduce our third character field marshal sir douglas haig Mm. Um, who was, as you probably know, in charge of the Battle of the Somme. Mm. Now, Haig, like a lot of the British generals, gets quite a bad press. And we're not here to discuss whether the Battle of the Somme was commanded well, or whether Haig was, in fact, a a donkey leading lions. But in this aspect, in the aspect of transport, in the aspect of railways... The evidence shows that Haig actually understood the challenges being faced and appreciated Mm. that actually the railways and the lines of communication were crumbling around him. Mm. Um, When Lloyd George communicated to the front that he was sending Geds to review the railways, certain people like the Quartermaster General were very reluctant to see him come. Um, The Quartermaster General actually basically took it as a personal affront at his logistics and organisational skills that Mm. the government kept sending people to review what was going on and was actually Mm. very annoyed that Geds was coming in the middle of the battle. Yes. War is very much anything, a game of logistics and communication and a a game of how much can you lob at the enemy. Um, You see one of the first things that was recognised in the Second World War by the British when they got hold of some German equipment was, oh my goodness, everyone has a radio that can talk both ways, or at least can receive. And communication and logistics is very much what you need during a war. You can't just lob stuff at the enemy because, well, the enemy might have moved. (laughs) Yeah. Let's be quite honest here. It's, It's not just, as many people think it is, just charge and just keep running. No, it's quite quite difficult. And this is we see this even today, like just 
to look at more recent examples in the Afghanistan war, um, you get a lot of, there's a lot of effort goes into communication, not just between troops, where now every, every troop has a radio. Yeah. And communication and, and making sure you can get stuff there is vital. Yes. And so you find the people in charge of logistics, so the Quartermaster General, the Inspector of Communications France, push back quite hard a bit against Ged's inspection. They are unhappy. Hmm. Yeah, this non-military individual. They are, they are unhappy that this civilian is being sent to review military logistics, which they maintain are not at fault, that there's not hmm. a problem with them, that they're doing the best they can, that the problem is that the war is just... Too big. Yes. Haig's response, on the other hand, is more pragmatic. Hmm. Um, and Haig writes back to Lloyd George to say, yeah, it's clearly not working. Mm. He needs to be aware that we're fighting the Battle of the Somme, and therefore I, I can't guarantee that he'll get very much resource from General Headquarters, because mm. we're currently engaged in the biggest military battle that the British have ever fought. But those resources that I can spare, I will spare for him. Mm. So Geds goes to France... He takes with him a few members for his inspection team. He takes, from the military side, he has a lieutenant colonel, Henry Mace, and a colonel, Henry Freeland, who he knew from before the war. Henry Mace had worked with Geds in India, and Freeland had also been helping prepare for the Railway Executive Committee before the war. Mm. And he also takes with him two civilians, Philip Nash, who had worked in India, and George Beharrell, who was one of Ged's assistants at the Northeastern Railway and was one of their top statisticians. Mm. It's the game of numbers is now being played and not just the game of lobster. Yes, yeah. they get to France and immediately decide that the time to write a report has well and truly passed. Mm. So Geds mm. writes back to Lloyd George and says, you sent me to France to produce reams and reams of paperwork and reports. The time for that has passed. The time now is for action, and you need to create a new organisation structure for the British Expeditionary Forces logistics. Specifically, he notes that the way the British Expeditionary Force had expanded over time had seen a significant amount of decentralisation in its command and coordination structure. Mm, which doesn't work for logistics. No, so what you find is local commanders on the ground are responsible for coordinating the rail transport in their area and in their mm. sector, which means that somebody's responsible for the logistics in a maybe three to ten mile area mm. and as we know railway systems are a bit larger than three to ten miles in general yeah and so if your local commander in one area is doing things really well there's no way for them to easily pass that on to other operations and there's no way for that to be implemented across the whole bf area mm. yes what we're getting here is you can have one individual with no trains because they've dealt with them for the whole week while another one's just got a ton piling up because they're just not dealing with them properly. Yeah. And this is basically what's happening is you've got parts of the front that have no trains and you've got parts of the out behind the front where you have sidings and sidings full of trains trying to get down a single line because mm. they can't go anywhere. And you've got sidings filling with trains, but there's no way of getting the munitions from the nearest railhead to the front mm. because we're talking about a piece of land covered in trenches barbed mm. wire shell crates like the it's not conducive to a railway <laughs> yeah the trenches were relatively static but they were moving mm. um the land around them is not good for driving your light world war one era trucks across no Let's be honest, the tank, the first tanks look like they were, did because you want the biggest radius circle you can get to climb over exactly. these things. They they look dumb because they were built for a very specific purpose. It's, they're basically like yeah. the Tsar tank, just a bit more sensible. Yeah. So Lloyd George and Hay completely agree. Like They're just like, yeah, you're absolutely right. It's too far gone. We need action. <laughs> And so a week after Lloyd George receives Ged's letter, sorry, no, a week after Ged sends his letter to Lloyd George, Lloyd George has formed a new directorate 
in the form of the Director of Military Railways, mm. to be headed by a new person known as the Director General Military Railways. This person will be responsible for coordinating all of the transport between the UK and the front. They will have direct access to the War Cabinet, the idea being that they can go, they can go to the War Cabinet where they can make the case for the military railways receiving vital supplies. We're talking steel, men, mm. equipment, fuel, coal, things that are highly sought after in the war effort. These things are being coordinated to various places and at this point, there's someone in the War Cabinet arguing for why steel should be sent to make helmets and shells and why coal needs to go to factories and power stations. But there's no one there arguing for the key sector of the railways. There's no mm. one saying, but there's no point making shells and helmets and equipment if we can't ship it mm. to the front. And this is the problem we've got at this point, is that Geds has done an excellent job at the Ministry of Judiciary, but you've got all of these shells that now can't get shipped to the front. Mm. So this new position of Director General Military Railways will be the person who coordinates the transport, sits in the War Council, and makes the case for why the railways need more resources, Mm. listens to what's going on in the War Council, understands what the logistics of moving the things that the council wants to do is going to be. Mm. The British recognised that the Somme had been a logistical disaster and were preparing new campaigns for 1917, and they wanted to make sure that the railways and the lines of communication would be ready to take that and to support that. They didn't want to repeat the Battle of the Somme. Mm. So Lloyd George appoints Eric Geddes as Director General Military Railways. So he's a bit of a pushback from the military because the post is technically within the army. It's a uh, position just below the Quartermaster General. And so Geddes is appointed honorifically as a Major General mm. by Lloyd George to make it clear where he sits within the military hierarchy and to pacify his now superiors and to give him actual authority over his inferiors. Mm. It's a case of the military very much this is all about its ranks and its command structure yeah. and those at the top don't like to be told what to do and those down below like to know who they're being told by. Yeah. One of the big resources I've used for this is Christopher Phillips' new book, Civilian Specialists at War. Mm. It's an excellent book. It looks at the role of civilians in Britain's war effort in the First World War, and he highlights that while the army was not anti-using civilian expertise, we discussed how they used the London, Chatham and Dover Railway earlier, mm. they were hesitant and they saw it as, most of them saw it as being necessary to use outsiders as information, but they didn't want outsiders telling the military what to do. Mm. Haig, on the other hand, Phillips argues, was actually very pro Ged's involvement and Ged's being involved in the military. He says that Haig was very much pro the promotion of suitable people who knew what they were doing mm. to posts and so was very much in support of Geds being appointed to this role. Haig recognised that the military was not capable of doing railway logistics on the scale that mm. they needed and that actually they needed to get railway professionals involved in the military who understood how to run mm. big heavy industrialised railways. They get how to move things from point A to point B in a mix of other things moving from point you know point A to point B and understand things like timetabling and just exactly. how to use your existing lines and existing signalling and all this stuff most efficiently. Yeah. Even things like how do you very quickly increase capacity on a line. Yeah. And so Geds is appointed director general military railways. This is a role in London. Mm. And simultaneously, the same week, Haig offers Geds the post of Director of Transport in France, mm. um, which he also takes up. So Geds is now working both as the overall strategic head of the military railways in London and the head of the organisation of the military railways within, or not just the railways, but all lines of communication within France. So he's in charge of the road transport and the shipping and the railways. Mm. So what we have is one individual 
controlling everything. Yeah, we have one person who is strategically in charge of the railways. And this, as I touched on in the episode on the Railway Act, is where Geds gets the idea for needing a centralised level of control over transportation. So just while he was in these wartime positions, he restructures basically every line of communication, doesn't he? Yeah. Starts doing things like, oh, we need to get things to the front. How do we do that? Well, let's build a new line. The French had been doing this for a while, and he steals their idea of temporary narrow-gauge railways extensively used to get stuff to the front. We had been using temporary narrow-gauges, but under Geds, there is a huge push to expand this network, to Mm. move stuff to the front. And the task that Geds faced was Herculean, but he rose to it. And there was an enormous improvement in Britain's um, logistics within France in this time, principally because General Headquarters and Haig supported what Geds was doing and would just give him the resources he needed, but also because Geds did what the military, or certain aspects of the military, had been resistant to doing, and he created a hybrid civilian military organisation. He absolutely had military officers within his two directorates where they had relevant skills and experience and knowledge and capabilities to improve it but he also brought in civilians who could further the military's knowledge and understanding the military does not know everything it does not have skills in Mm. everything and so he helped the military to learn how to conduct this sort of warfare and himself learnt the importance of a coordinated, integrated transport system Mm. where you're not looking anymore at... Well, previously, it wasn't just that people were looking at the railways or the roads or the maritime transport, but they were looking at specifically just the road or rail transport to my sector. Mm. And I think this is something we will most certainly be coming back to a lot. One of my friends, Gareth Dennis, he talks a lot about integration and this idea of you should treat this problem of moving stuff moving you know widgets moving people moving things as one problem which has these different ways of solving it and different tools to solve it but you can't just exclusively use one tool yes so it's this experience within the war this experience of being and seeing how being in charge of everything can produce a functioning transport network that leads Geds down the road, not of supporting nationalisation. He doesn't support nationalisation of the railways in the long term. His view is clearly communicated that he supports the idea of regional transport companies. He is, after all, the architect and the author of the Railway Act and the Ministry of Transport that we got in 1919 and 1921. And certainly the Railway Act is very much Geds's vision for the railways. The Ministry Mm. of Transport was massively watered down to a point where, as I covered in the main episode, it was essentially just the Ministry of Railways with a little bit of road responsibility. But this is where, when Geds first proposes the Ministry of Transport be created as it is in 1918, this is why he proposes that it is an all-encompassing department that can coordinate all of the maritime transport and all of the roads and all of the railways and all of the lines of communication. He even goes so far as to say that it should include the telegraph and telephone networks Mm. and possibly even the mail service Mm. because he believes that while some of these organisations should be private concerns, they should be centrally coordinated. Mm. Mm. I think that that's a concept, again, that we will probably come across multiple times through this show Mm. is this idea that coordination of entities makes sense even within organizations that different parts of an organization should communicate with other parts is something that i will most certainly be exploring in in the next episode Mm. but this idea that you can't just have individuals working on their own thing because you just end up all doing different things that don't really mesh well and you can still have private entities but it's just making them mesh yes I think this is what Geds really is a trailblazer for. Yes. As we cover in the the main episode, unfortunately, the political will was not there. Mm. As you say, as we see today, departments within the government resist having aspects of their purview taken off them. Mm. 
because it would be all-encompassing, but it would apply Geds's wartime experience and learning to the peacetime civilian mm. world. It would touch every corner of the country and every single yes. entity, like every single business, every single person who happened to ship stuff or happened to... Yeah. communicate that would be touched by this this idea that a factory yes. in the north can chip something to a shop in anglia and it would be a complete logistical change through and through and that's the interesting thing because geds was a businessman he was a conservative he was a conservative politician he was approaching this from a conservative businessman point of view and outlook after his time in parliament he would go on to become a director of dunlop rubber and chairman of imperial airways and indeed following the war he was at the head of the National Expenditure Committee, which proposed enormous cuts and austerity across the public sector to try and match the fact that tax revenue was falling. But equally, his conservative and business attitude was that actually to make the most of your economic output, you need to coordinate, you need to be working together. And I find that quite interesting mm. that here we find some Someone who decides that central control and government control of industry and transportation and logistics is required. Something that you'd normally associate with the Soviet Union mm. or communist regime, mm. but actually is here coming out of a capitalist and a mm. businessman. Mm. And it's very interesting it comes out of them. And it's interesting that this like, perspective has almost shifted in a way that now for conservative, it's not about maximising your efficiency and your economic output output as such and your profit then through coordination it's instead you do this on an individual basis and everyone's competing against each other and is and this idea that competition is the way forwards you know, everyone should be fighting for their own little scrap whereas Geds was thinking we should all work together for the good of each other while still supporting this capitalist utopia of everyone can make their own way it's almost monopolistic mm. but it retains an aspect of competition like, as we've seen in the the main episode, the Railway Act did not produce a clean cut of the railways. There was still competition within the system, but a lot of the idea is that competition and duplication creates waste. And so to an aspect of this, there is the idea that actually coordination will allow mm. specifically for the modes to compete in certain areas, but also for some intramode competition. And this is a big reason I wanted to talk about Geds, because he's a very enigmatic figure within the literature. Um, there are a couple of books about him, specifically for this episode. I've relied on Keith Greaves' biography of mm. Geds, which is from the 80s, and I've also relied on another book from the, the 80s, Peter Klein's chapter to Eric Geddes and the experiment with business in government, which is from the book Essays in Labour and History. Um, the the book references notes. are obviously all down in the show notes, but mostly he's referenced within a few texts, he's referenced within a chapter, but there's not a lot on him. But he's a very interesting and plays quite a significant role in a number of major events, mm. but the historiography on him is extraordinarily limited. We all know the name David Lloyd George and Douglas Haig, and mm. there's loads written on the military commanders of the Somme. But yet Geds just sort of ticks along under the radar, never quite being picked up as the focus of attention, despite mm. the extraordinary things he's just sort of doing in the background, mm. just shaping massive parts of Britain's policy and governance through from 1911 through to about 1922, when he... Um, leaves the commons mm. so that's why I, I wanted to cover this and i think moving forward like as a society we should maybe start looking back at people like get and their visions mm. i mean not necessarily implementing them in the exact way that they thought but certainly thinking about well what was good about this man's ideas well maybe having the central body that is like far reaching and can control huge amounts of logistics this thing that can just say okay we will be shipping steel now by rail but it yes. will be taken from the factories to this facility and this idea rather than having private entities work this out themselves yeah and this is the big thing with history and this is why i believe passionately that 
understanding history is important, why I yes. think it's vital that we look back at the past, that we find people like Getz who are not so well looked at and understood, and we see what they did, we understand what they were trying to do, and we look back and we go, well, what was good? What was bad? What should we learn? What can we learn? What could we implement that wasn't implemented but would be useful now? There's a reason it's so warm outside right mm. now. Stuff like better coordination of city logistics saying, actually, do we need 400 delivery drivers trying to deliver one package each to one street? Mm. Or could we condense all of those trucks down into one truck that just does centralised logistics? And as I say, this is why history is important. This is why I love looking back. I also hate it because I look back and I'm like, well, why didn't we do that then? Goodness, And I understand why. Like, I'm a historian. I've looked at the history. I know why things weren't done. I understand the historiography and the, the issues at the time as to why stuff didn't happen but I look at stuff and I'm like well why didn't we do this because this mm. would have been so good to do but mm. well, this is why history is important because we can go back and we can go well why didn't we do it then but let's not dwell on the fact we didn't do it let's do it now mm. because now is better than never at least we could do it now and try and recover what we missed out on mm. yes So that's our first bonus episode of Rails to Nowhere. Again, thank you if you've subscribed to the Patreon for supporting us. Your support makes this possible. (laughs) Yes, your support makes this very much possible. Yes, um, but for now, I think there's not much else to say besides follow the Twitter at Rails to Nowhere. At Rails to Nowhere for the Twitter, patreon.com forward slash Rails to Nowhere yep. to support us on Patreon if you're not already. You can find both of us on Twitter if you decide you want to follow us. Yes, I am at Ella the Developer. And I am at Asperger's Dragon. Yep, they will be in the show notes too. And yep. besides that, patrons, of course, you feel free to use the message thing we will try and get back to you within a timely manner no promises we're both very busy people (laughs) but remember to comment and if you're watching on youtube hit that like button and hit the subscribe button yes and if you're listening on itunes or google podcasts or apple podcasts whatever your platform of choice is make sure to give us a review it really helps the algorithms are against us as always we must pray to the algorithm gods um otherwise that's that's it from me that's it from me thank you for listening and we shall be arriving on your podcast platform of choice again very soon